Hey guys, this is Martin Perdomo, the elite strategist. And today I have um, Carla Moreno here. And Carla is originally from Mexico. She's been licensed for four years as a licensed real estate investor. Her and her wife are real estate investors and they specialize on the Burr method to Airbnb. And I'm so glad to have her. She's also the past president of the National Association of, of Hispanic Real Estate uh, Professionals. In, 2010, in 2020, so she's the past president. I'm excited to have her here. Uh, she spe- like I said, she specializes in the bird method and um, her and her wife love traveling and eating. And I was just sharing with her, she looks great to be, to be an eater like me, so I know she works out. So um, thank you for being here, Carla. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have you here and for you to share some of your wisdom and insights and what you've learned and what you're doing out there in this market, there's so much happening in the world right now, especially with the Airbnb. So welcome, dear. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. Perfect, my dear. Well, first question I'm going to get into with you is I'm going to ask you, what is the one thing that you do that has gotten you the most success, Carla? What is the one thing that you do that you attribute your success to? Visualization. That is the number one thing that I, I never leave out of my day. Sometimes it's, it's hard to squeeze it in, in, in the day, but I just make sure that I wake up, that I schedule a couple hours in the morning for me. So I have time to visualize, to organize my day so that I'm productive because we all have the same hours in one day. It's just about how we arrange them and how productive we can be. Awesome. So when you say visualization, what does that mean? So what, what does that look like? I mean, you went right to it, girl. I love it because you went right to the woo-woo-ness. Because, <laughs> you know, I always tell people and I always talk about this podcast, man, uh, I'm a, what you call a practical woo-woo. So, so some men, so many people, visualization and vision boards and, and all of these things and meditation, that's woo-woo, right? But um, I always share here, I'm a practical woo If it works, I do it. If it doesn't work, I don't do it, right? So, so you yeah. went right to it. So tell us about that. What does that really mean? Like, when do you do that? What, is, what does visualization mean for those, of, those that might be listening or watching? What does that process look like to you? Well, for me, first of all, every quarter, I just schedule one day for myself to set goals for that one quarter. I, I visualize where is it that I want to be, what is it that I want to accomplish, and then I break it down into, okay, if I need to do this in a quarter, then what do I need to do these um, every month, every week, every day? And then in addition to doing my quarterly goals and visualizing, I, do a, I actually do a vision board. I, in my office, I have a chalk wall. And I just draw and write down whatever is it that I want to do, whether it is um, finish furnishing X amount of Airbnbs or whatever it is. I just put it in my vision board. And then every day I just put music, um, music for relaxation or visualization. And I just set five or 10 minutes, close my eyes and just set an intention for the day or set an intention for the week or the month or whatever outcome is it that I want to accomplish. I set my intention and it's not, nothing complicated other than just closing my eyes and feeling what it, what it is, what, what it feels like to already have accomplished it. I absolutely love that. I, I absolutely love that because, uh, you know, I interview a lot of different people here, very successful people in different areas of life, especially mostly real estate. And that's one common denominator right there, you know, visualization, the morning routine, taking the time to um, set their quarterly goals. So let's talk about, let's talk about your your quarterly goals. You said every 90 days, you said you take a day for yourself. Tell us what does that look like, right? Because it takes a a heck of a lot of discipline. You know, I I often talk to people and I have students that I also coach. And, uh, and this is the, the biggest thing, right? The biggest thing is people think that success occurs right now in real life right and it doesn't it really does not success really occurs what you do when no one's watching that visualization that planning that strategizing that getting clear on what you want and uh, so so tell us about that Carla what does that look like to you what is that exactly so what it looks like I, I have four pillars or three or four pillars that I want to focus on because not everything success means different things to different people 
And so I focus on three or four areas. For example, financial goals. Where is it that I want to be at the end of the three months? Um, where also um, like family or personal goals. What do I want to accomplish, whether, whether it is um, strengthening my relationship with my wife or fitness goals? So I just set three or four goals and then I break it down. Okay, so for example, if I want to um, purchase X amount of houses, well, how many, that means if I, need to, if I want to purchase one house in that quarter, then how many houses do I need to evaluate? How many hours do I need to spend looking at deals? How many offers do I need to put so that I can land that one deal? And so it's just breaking it down and, and making it clear because sometimes we can want a lot of things, but if we don't have a clear goal on how to accomplish it, it might be a little cloudy or difficult to know what exactly is it that we need to do. Awesome. I love that. And I know, I know coming from a Latino background, right? You being from Mexico, being Mexican, me, me being coming from my, my family being Dominican. Originally, I know we're not raised with that. Like they don't, I know your parents probably didn't teach you that, or your grandparents probably didn't teach you that, or your relatives didn't teach you that. You probably learned this in books and, and things like that. So I want to talk about that a little bit. How, how does one person, uh, how does a person like you coming from the background that you and I come from where we're, we're taught that you got to work hard, um, go get a job, get an education, right? Get an education and, and work <laughs> hard. And, uh, and, and that's how you do it. You work hard. We, we model our parents. We model our grandparents. We see them busting their butts, right? Just working hard, 12 hours, 10 hours. That's what they teach us. That's what they project to us. How does now all of this woo-woo stuff you're talking about come into play and change your mindset? To not work as hard, but to work a little bit different. Because this is not, it's not that it's not working hard, because I, I, trust me, I know that this is, it takes a lot of work because it takes a lot of discipline to do what you and I do, right? To sit there every, you know, I do journals every morning. I journal, meditate every morning. I have a, you know, vigorous routine. And uh, one day I was in, I'll share this with you before you answer this. One day I was, um, Sunday, I was, it it takes me about an hour, an hour and a half. I spend every Sunday about an hour, an hour and a half through my journal. My wife goes, you know, what you do is hard. She was like, how do you do that every week? You know, every week you just do it. You just, and I'm like, babe, it's just, what's the alternative? The alternative is us being poor. The alternative is us being broke. The alternative is us being average like everyone else. That's the option. This is the real work right here. This is the planning, setting intention, setting my week, setting my goals. Like this is the real work. People think that the real work is when you're doing. It's not. It's be way before that. So how do you, uh, how did you change that? How did you adapt that? How do you do that? <laughs> well, first of all, I think I was very lucky to have been born in a household where actually, at least my mom is the one who taught me about mindset. Mm -hmm. Since a very young age, um, she was a clear example of how thinking positively or by thinking positively, good things happen to you. So, Martin, I was actually very lucky to have been born in a household where, mindset, where, where they were aware of mindset, at least my mom. So I was introduced to this um, when I was young. I remember one time we went to this camping trip where we needed cash. There were no credit cards allowed. It was just visiting small towns and um, we had to have cash. So my mom brought all her cash and put it in her pocket. And at one point she lost it. She didn't know where it was. We were at the beginning of the trip. So we needed that trip, that money to survive. And instead of her freaking out, she, she told me, let's just take a moment, close our eyes and Think about maybe where can the money be or visualize that we find the money. And maybe it's in one of, and we had searched in all of our pockets everywhere. The money was gone. And, uh, but instead of her, again, being stressed about the situation, she was calm. And she said, just close your eyes and attract positive vibes and, and visualize that everything is going to be okay. Visualize that we're at the end or that we find the money and we have so much fun in the trip. It's going to be okay. And then several minutes later, we opened our eyes 
And, um, and then the money appeared in one of the pockets. We were yeah. calm about it. And yes, and, and so that was my first lesson. She said, everything, every time something bad happens or you think something bad is happening, instead of freaking out, just close your eyes and, and know that everything is going to be okay. You just have to remain calm and think positively. Think of a positive outcome and think that visualize yourself as, for example, opening your purse and finding the money. You just have to visualize a positive outcome. And so I don't know who taught my mom this or where she got it from, but um, constantly she kept reminding me of this. So to me, that was sort of natural to have that sort of thinking. And I know that I'm very lucky because it's not something common. Not in a Latino household, that's for sure, right? Not, in a, <laughs> not, not where we come from, that's for sure. We're, we talk work hard and, you know, break it back and work as hard as you can and put your head down and go to work. So let me let, let's get into real estate. I want to talk to you about real estate. So I know that you and your, and your wife currently have uh, four Airbnbs. You guys are specializing in the Burr method. Tell me about that. How did you get started in real estate? So you come from from a great household. Your mom taught you some great mindset strategies, which you were very blessed to have that. Most of us have to learn it in books, have to get mentors, have to learn it from others. You were blessed to have that. So um, real estate, why real estate? How did you get started in real estate? Tell us that story. <laughs> it's actually funny how it happened because I was studying for my MCAT. So I, I was applying to, for medical schools and or two medical schools. And I was taking the, the MCAT is, is a medical admissions test. And it's an eight hour test. You have to train and study for about some people train for less but on average at least six months because it's a very difficult exam mm -hmm. and so I was training for it my wife is a lender and I remember she had a um, pre-approved lead it was just a matter of an agent showing the house to this client so they could submit an offer and the agent said no you know what that's out of my range it's a 30 minute drive from my house and I don't drive more than 20 minutes and my wife hung up the phone and she was just uh, mesmerized by, by this, right? Because it's a pre-approved client. It's, according to her, it was so easy. So she looks at me and says, you know what? During your gap year, you should get your realtor license. It's so easy. Realtors don't do much and they make a lot of money. So just do it in your gap year. <laughs> and there I go. I, I got my, my um, certification and I started working as, a, as an agent. And I remember one of the things that my dad used to tell me was, whatever you do, just make sure that you're the best. It doesn't matter which profession you pick, just make sure that you're the best. And so I still took the MCAT, of course, I applied to medical schools. And while I was waiting to hear from them, well, I was trying to be, well, I got my license and I was uh, trying to be the best agent. And so in my first month, I closed two transactions. That first year, I closed 24 transactions, which wow. is not typical for a rookie. And, and I loved it. I loved real estate so much that I found my passion and I never looked back to going back to medical school. Awesome. Good so for you. That's how I got into it. And then how we got into development or because we also do um, some development for low income housing. And same thing, it's, it's usually my wife that pushes me into the unknown and, and she's like, it's so easy, we'll figure it out as we go. And so there was this land for sale and um, it was big. I, I think it was like two acres. And she said, let's just buy it and subdivide it. I don't think it's too hard because her parents used to live in a rural area where they used to buy land and then put a manufactured home, et cetera. And so we, we did that. It was not as easy as, as uh, we thought it would be. But three years later, we finally finished with the short plan with the help of family members. We ended up partnering together and, and doing great things. So that's how we started into the development. And um, finally, in the, how we got into the Airbnb, same thing about mindset. We used to look at lake houses and think, ah, oh, I wish I had one. One day I want one of those. And then when we started looking, they were pretty expensive and, and we couldn't afford it. But um, 
I'm sure you you remember the quote for um, Robert Ke what Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad would say, which was, "How can I afford it?" Instead mm -hmm. of saying, "I can't afford it." Mm -hmm. And so we said, "Okay, we're living in this condo and we're paying a lot of money in HOAs, and we like to travel. And when we travel, we can't rent our house to make up a little bit of of money that that we're spending on mortgage." So how can we afford a lake house? So we said, well, maybe if we sell our condo and we buy a fixer upper so we can rent a room or finish a basement and, and rent the basement, that way we get more income. Our mortgage by default goes down a little bit. So that allows us to save more money and buy a lake house. And we did that, and we were super successful with our with our first Airbnb. I loved it, and that's how we kept going. Awesome! That sounds that sounds really, really, really cool. And I want you to share with me now some of the horror stories, some of the difficult times, some of the difficulties, and how how your mindset, you and your wife's mindset, allowed you to overcome that. Right? Maybe your first deal. Right? Tell me some of those horror stories with contractors. Tell me some of those difficult times. Um, is there a time that you had a deal that was just, oh my goodness, you felt like pulling your hair out. It's just one thing after the other thing, after the other thing, after the other thing. But yet you kept that positive mindset. You kept that, that, that mindset. Tell us, share one of those stories with us. Well, it was actually that lake house that, that we wanted. We ended up buying it. And we're actually here in the lake house. Oh, cool. And it, it was, a, it's amazing. It, it, it was an amazing story. It came with its hurdles. Uh, first of all, is be, we didn't know it was our first house that we had close to the shoreline. So all the permits and the things and loopholes that you need to go through, it's just incredible. So we bought this house with hard money. And as you, as you probably know, uh, and, and just to go a little bit into what hard money is, is they give you a loan for a, a certain amount of time, example, two months, uh, 12 months, and it's interest only. So you have to refinance quickly. With all of our other houses, it typically takes us three to four months to get the house in shape and good condition so that we can refinance out of that hard money. Well, it turns out that we had issues and difficulties of uh, getting the permit to rebuild the deck. Mm. So it was- The deck the, at that, the deck. The deck, wow. yes, it, there's, there were two double decks. So it seems something simple, but because we're in the shoreline, we had, it was a nightmare, a serious nightmare. Just now, barely a year later, they're building the deck finally, wow. but- um it was very stressful because if we didn't have the decks, we it's likely that we would not have been able to refinance because the it's very dangerous. So you have to have decks because if you open the door, you'll fall. Mm -hmm. And um, the way we, it was, there was a point where we thought we just had to sell the house as is. And, and um, because if we couldn't refinance or get out of that hard money loan, it was going to be difficult. But um, we just thinking about positive mindset and, and how things happen for us, not to us. Oh, I love that. We had, mm -hmm. <laughs> we had the fortune of, um, we said, well, let's just try to do the refinancing and, and see what happens. And we had the nicest appraiser come to the house. Uh, they typically don't like to talk to people. Uh -huh. <laughs> And he was super nice about the whole situation. Our, the door, we bought a folding doors. And so if he saw that it was a door, there was no way he was going to pass the appraisal mm -hmm. because it's um, hazardous. But I told my wife, just sit by the handle, pretend that you're working, let's put a plan so he doesn't see the handle and he thinks it's just huge windows. <laughs> so <it's> <laughs> 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 okay so, so she did exactly that she was there he he was walking around her and it was a little awkward because she wouldn't move right next to a plant covering the handle the entire time so i guess he thought it was handled because he was it, not not handled so i guess window. he thought it was a window because he passed the appraisal as is no conditions oh we had stairs with no handrails okay 
That's no way. They're... <laughs> That's easy to fix. We live on like we live on a cliff. The house is on a cliff, so you pretty much. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you mm -hmm. didn't handle, but but um, no no conditions, and uh, we were very very blessed because that saved the entire deal. We were able to keep the house and not stress too much about the timing on the deck. Okay, so I want to talk about because there might be someone listening right now thinking. Oh my gosh, I'm going through all these challenges in my first house. And there's one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. And, and I, I want to talk about the conversations you and your wife had while you were going through this, because, you know, I remember one of my first flips, we had, I fired three contractors, my first flip, three contractors, it, pipes froze, I think three or four times. We live in, I, I'm in the Poconos in, in Pennsylvania and it was, we were having a really tough winter and the pipes just kept freezing, freezing, freezing. I, I mean, it was a nightmare. We fired three contractors and, um, you know, I had a particular mindset and I had a particular attitude. I had a particular conversation with myself every time I had something same like you, right? Hey, life is happening for me. Where's my opportunity? Where's my lesson? How can I get better? What were the conversations you and your wife were having? You see, because people think people look at the glory, right? So people may look at you and say, wow, that's awesome. You have, you know, uh, four properties, you burn them, you burn them, which means basically buy rent, uh, a buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. You have any, no money into it. You have infinity rate of return. You're, you're killing it, right? You're just, you're Airbnb and that's exciting. That's really exciting stuff. You're creating wealth long-term. You're creating cash flow. You don't have to work necessarily for it. I mean, although there is work, but it's not like, you know, regular work. And people mm -hmm. may look at that and say, well, that's so awesome. That's exciting. But they don't know the other side to that. There is another side to that. There is a journey to get to that. There is the the hardships to get to that. So what were those conversations? Because a lot of people give up before they can get over those humps. So this is not for me, right? And I reject that for my listeners and for you. But what were your conversations? How were you guys getting in the weeds about uh, those challenges that you were having then? What were you guys, what was your conversations like? Well, I'll tell you about this recent thing that happened because the conversations are, are a little bit more fresh in my mind. So two days ago, um, our Airbnb tenant or guest texts me and she says, I was doing laundry and the whole basement is now flooded. So I said, well, maybe it's just it's some bad connection or something. The plumber goes there and he calls me and says, uh, you need a sewer scope, blah, blah, blah. He comes back the next day to do a sewer to scope the line and it turns out our sewer line is broken mm -hmm. he gives us an estimate and it's forty two thousand dollars to Ooh. fix the entire because Ooh. it's a it's a big prop it's a big property mm -hmm. and pretty much the break is on one side of the property mm -hmm. and it has to connect to the other side so it's it was a nightmare um i can tell you that i was very frustrated, especially because, well, we have guests. We had another guest coming in, checking in. She actually checked in yesterday and um, family of 10 people. She was super excited to get there. Uh, she had booked for two weeks. So it was a substantial amount of money. So now not only do I have to cancel on people, I know how difficult it is when you plan on arriving somewhere and they cancel your house. So, um, I was very stressed. I had a terrible stomach ache and my wife just, we had this conversation and she said, well, it's all money. We all have to go through hurdles. So as long as it's money, we'll figure it out. Let's just find out what is it that's stressing you the most. Is it the money to fix the, um, the sewer line? Is it that you need to cancel on the gas? What is it? Think about what's stressing you the most and then we'll tackle one thing at a time. And I sat down and reflected, okay, I think what's stressing me the most is to cancel this reservation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when everything is so overwhelming and we don't take action, we just sit down and get overwhelmed, we don't achieve anything. Mm -hmm. So by reflecting on what is it that's stressing us the most and, and, and then determining, well, what is the worst case scenario? Because that's always good to know, right? And so I said, well, the worst case scenario is I'll have a bad review and maybe I'll, lo I'll lose um, super host status, which I can 
get back at one point. So that is a, I can recover. So that's the worst case, which is like, nobody is going to die. And I reached out to the whole, to the guest and she was super nice about it. She even offered to not shower, not use the restroom, nothing because her, she was there visiting her daughter-in-law who lives just a couple houses down. So she said, please let me stay. Uh, I own Airbnbs as well. I know how it is. Don't be stressed about it. You're already stressed about fixing the sewer line. So let me say I won't use the bathroom, showers, nothing. Wow. So I said, exactly. So that's the power of thinking positively and thinking about solutions. Because I could have just canceled on her. Instead, I, I offered three potential solutions. And then I said, unless you can think of something else, I'm willing to make it work. Let's just have a conversation about what can we do? And so that led to her offering this. And now she's checked in. She loves the house. The plumber was able to tackle everything down beforehand. So now everyone is happy and the problem got fixed. Of course, now we need to pay for the repairs. But that's that's why it's so important to always in the budget save for repairs. Let's talk about that. I want to talk about that a little bit. So, so, so the, the, there's so much to unpack there, right? So, so the, the first thing is that I, that I grabbed from that, for me, the first lesson is the mindset, right? The mindset of, Hey, your wife was wise enough to say, Hey, let's, let's figure out what is it that's stressing you. And you got to the root of the cause. You got to the root of the cause. You were able to deal with the cause, right? And you were able to make decisions, because a lot of times people, people find themselves stressed out. And the worst thing that we can do is do nothing, right? When you do nothing, you'll get nothing or things won't change, right? Or you do the same things and expect different results. You're, you're crazy, right? Exactly. So that, that's the first thing you did. That's the first lesson I took from it is that you actually isolated, you sat down and you did the hard work of thinking. So my, my mentor always tells me, he always tells us is um, people don't want to do the hard work of thinking. And you did the hard work of thinking. Right. And I always say that to my employees, um, my students, my mentees is you have to do the hard work of thinking. No one wants to do the hard work of thinking people. You know, some people think that these CEOs, right, big CEOs that are getting paid a lot of money they look at the top of the food chain. And, oh, my God, he's making all that money. And the guy that might be cleaning the floor might say, I work harder than him, but not understanding that him is responsible for everything. And he has to do the hard work of thinking for everyone. No one wants to do the hard work of thinking. You guys did that. So I commend you for that. The next thing is that you actually took action. Is what I'm taking from it. You actually took action. You moved forward. You found solutions. You, you, you just move. You, you plowed through it. And, and I commend you for that. So, um, so you fixed this sewer line. People were in there. Everyone is happy, right? Now, what's next with this particular property? Now you have this bill, right? Now you have this bill, 42, is it still $42,000? Did you negotiate that? Did you work anything else out? Negotiated it down to 35. <laughs> well, okay, that's still good. That's, hey, man, that's $7,000. That's, that's pretty significant, right? So let's talk mm-hmm. about the numbers. Let's talk about how you run the numbers. Let's talk about, you know, because when I teach my students, I host a couple of real estate investors meetups. And I, um, I also, you know, I also coach and I teach and I mentor. And, and that's the thing, like discipline, right? The discipline in the numbers. Discipline in your numbers. And what does that mean? Right. I used to self-manage years ago when I first started in 2007. I used to self-manage. I burned myself out, got out of the business because I was doing Mr. Handyman, Mr. Property Manager, Mr. Everything. That doesn't work long term. Right. You need a team. You need people around you to help you do certain things. You cannot do this. It's not sustainable long term. Um, that's where is those guys that try to do everything. That's the, the ones that become the motivated sellers down the line because they get you know, you know this, they become the, the frustrated landlords. I'm done. I'm tired. I can't do this anymore because they're doing everything. They don't have a team. They never created that infrastructure. So talk to me about the discipline on the numbers. Yes, you just said it. You said, hey, you know, thank God we have, you know, we, we have the numbers. We have people become slumlords because they don't save that money. They eat everything they kill, right? The reason people become slumlords is because they take all the money from the rents. They pay the taxes, insurance, and mortgage. They take everything else and they eat it and they pay their bills and they, and they don't put money in reserves for vacancies. They don't put money in reserves for repairs. They don't put money in, refer, in reserves for any of that stuff. 
that you and I both know, like the $42,000 sewer line, right? you, yeah. it happens. It's not if, it's when it happens, you're going to need a roof. You're going to need a boiler. You're going to need, tell us about that. Tell us about how you do, how you and your wife are disciplining your numbers and how you guys run your numbers to make sure that when something like this happens, you guys are insulated and you can keep running your business. Yes. And I think that's the hardest part because I would be lying if I told you we are so good about uh, putting everything aside to the thought. And it's a learning process. And we've learned throughout the, throughout the years that it's very important to put money aside for those things. So again, um, we learned to, and with time, we of course are perfectioning the numbers and making sure that Everything stays um, clean that we don't touch that, even if it sounds uh, very appealing and looks like a substantial down payment for another house. Um, we've learned that money has to stay there because like you said, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so just running the numbers and make sure there's money aside for vacancy rates, for capital expenditures, and for other minor repairs. So because we completely renovate the houses, we don't put too much money aside for repairs because the house is pretty much brand new. But mm. in this case, um, I mean, we, we did know that we had to do, we had to repair the sewer line at one point. The good thing that worked in our favor though, is that we're planning to do a detached additional dwelling unit in the back because it's a huge garage. So we're going to convert it. So now that the trench is going to be open, well, at least we're going to save a little bit of money by already running all the utilities and the hole is going to be open and, and run the sewer line to the DADU. So that's mitigating costs a little bit. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, thank you so much for being here, God. I mean, this was so awesome. I mean, I, 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 learned, I learned a bunch from you. Um, with some of the things you've gone through it, you were blessed to have a mother that, that taught you about mindset and you lived it, you saw it, you experienced it. So how blessed and awesome that is for you. I have a question for you. I know that you have a, um, you have a, a course that you do, you do coaching as well, right? You're doing some sort of coaching, coaching as well, mentoring, teaching yes. people about MB. Can you tell us if people wanted to get a hold of you? Uh, what is it that you're doing? Let's say someone is listening, they resonate with what you're doing, what, and they're like, you know, I love to learn from her and learn how she's burying properties and and all that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we've um, we've been able to find financial um, stability and security through real estate, and I love to teach. So my course is designed for people who want to start in real estate but don't know how. They want to start investing and. I like the twist that we're doing, the Burr method, along with the short-term rentals, because it's a higher cash on return. And most people would think that it's a full-time job to run an Airbnb. And it's all about systems. Like you were saying, you, you can't do everything, but you mm -hmm. can put systems in place and then have somebody run with the idea and just tackle the, or take care of everything else. But mm -hmm. it's um, just a matter of, sitting down, organizing everything. So that's what we teach. If they want to hear more about it, they can find me on my Instagram. It's um, the she investor. The she, S-H-E investor? Yes. Okay. Or my website, carlamoreno.com. Awesome. Spell that. Carla, C-A-R-L-A. -A. Yeah, yes. Carla. Mo Moreno, Carla Moreno, M-O-R-E-N-O. -O. Carla yeah. Moreno. Dot com. So if you guys want to find Carla, you want to learn from her, she's got some courses, go to her IG, the she investor at IG or Carla Moreno.com and um, check in, check in with her. You have your courses on there. You have your, your stuff on there on your website, Carla. Yes. Yes. Um, we have information about how to contact me because it's, this is a beta program. So we're currently on our third class. It's a seven week master class. Right now we have 13 students ongoing and um, this is a beta program. So we'll, as, as time progresses, we'll put everything there, packaged, one-on-one um, -on -one sessions with me, all the information will be there. 
guys, check out Carla. I mean, if you if you resonate with Carla and um, you, you're vibing with what she's doing with her Airbnb, she's burying an Airbnb. I love that. That's a good method. I burr all of my my whole portfolio pretty much is burr. Um, I do a lot of buy, fix, and flips. And I'm thinking about dabbling in, 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 in Airbnb. I'll tell you, it's not my strategy. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, it's not my it's not my thing. I lived through 2007 as an investor, 2007, 2009. And um, short-term rentals got clobbered during that time. So I still remember that pain. However, I have a different skill set now. In 2021, I'm wiser, I'm smarter, and I buy really good deals. So I am considering playing in your field a little bit. I live in the Pocono, so nosotros estamos in a, in a vacation resorty type area. So it's kind of cool for that. So uh, Carla, you thank, you so, thank you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate you being here. Um, and I hope to have you back on here sometime in the near future, my dear. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Martin. Pleasure. Uh -huh.